Hello, Paul Grimala, born June 3rd, 1946, Worcester, Massachusetts. Grew up mostly in Grafton, Massachusetts. Entered the Marine Corps from Grafton. What was your childhood like? Did you play sports or? Played some sports, but mostly unorganized sports. A lot of uh, kids in your neighborhood? Yeah, we had a, had a regular crew, probably eight, nine guys. So you, we jumped ahead, you joined the Marine Corps was that something you plan on doing, or did you eventually no. in high school get into the military? How did you get... Interesting story. Okay. I had four friends that were going in, needed a ride into Worcester in the post office, which was the recruiting station. They walked in, and they did their thing, did their thing. By the time I walked out, I had joined. <laughs> had no intention of joining. So No, it, it really, it, you know, growing up in the 60s, the military was the furthest thing from my mind anyway, and I'm pretty sure the other guys too. They just did it on a spur of the moment thing, and I got sucked in. <laughs> but in my particular group, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something we talked about. It wasn't something we even thought about until it came draft time. I got my draft letter, went up, went through the whole physical, got to the last doctor, flat feet. One why, physically unfit. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the Selective Service Board? Yeah, that was, that was the draft, Selective Service. Did you have plans to go to college? What did you do in high school? What, what were your plans going to be? I went to trade school. I graduated as a carpenter. Uh, interesting thing, and he mentioned it with the military, in, in the junior year, the recruiter came in for the Seabees, and where I was, was a construction battalion. And I was a carpenter. They were recruiting people, carp carpentry, electricity, all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to go. The mother said no. <laughs> and what was her reasoning? She didn't want to see you go off? No, she didn't want me to go. What year was this? This would have been 1963. So the CBs, the Navy came to your trade. What trade school did you go to? Worcester. It was Worcester Boys Trade at the time. Now I think it's the Worcester Industrial Technical Institute. Okay. Witty. So your junior year, your mother put the kibosh on and she said, Oh, no. yeah. No, right. you want no part of that. <laughs> um, that's understandable. Being a parent now, you don't want to see your kids, you know, in harm's way or anything like that. Yeah, so what, harm's so you, way on a backhoe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but still, parents don't know. The military is the military to all yep. parents, right? So you graduated in what year? 64. And what did you do that year after you graduated? Absolutely nothing. Got into trouble mostly. What kind of trouble? Oh, drinking, just being an ass. <laughs> you know. Nothing crazy, just no, nothing, stuff. nothing really serious. It was kid stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Did that? You think that kind of influenced you to maybe now look at the military? You drove your friends to the recruiter. What was the pitch? What What was interesting to you? Was it him? I, I think it was, it was, was just it the... a, those four guys were going, and we had been buddies almost all of our lives. So I figured, well, what the hell? I'll go with them. Signed up. Do you remember their names? Oh, yeah. Brad Fields, Stash Tapera, Eddie Goulet, and Bobby Maynard. And Paul Grimal. And Paul Grimal. So there's five of you now. It was five of us, yeah. Corps. But one, Brad, Brad had a heart attack a few years ago. Stan lost his leg in Vietnam. I got wounded. The other two walked away unscathed. Uh, what essentially did the recruiter say that got you to sign on that dotted line? I don't think he convinced me. I just kind of convinced myself that just to get away, you know, to travel and excitement and all that kind of stuff because we've really never really never been further than Connecticut <laughs> you know what I'm saying so it was just I thought it'd be interesting did the Marine Corps play anything into it like did you know more about the Marine Corps than the Army the Navy the Air Force did they have a reputation to you or your friends that I, I think being the Marine Corps uh, everybody knew more about the Marine Corps than the other branches unless they had a real interest in the other branches. Right. Yeah. Unique uniform. Yeah, it, it, was, it was everything. A lot everything of movies when you were All the stuff you Marines. see on TV. Yeah. Vietnam really hadn't started then. It was, right. it was, it was just starting so to heat up. So this is 65. Yeah. 
66. This is 66 now? It was August of 66. So, yeah, the Marines have been there for a good year. They landed yeah, a they, year they before came that. in in 65, but the war itself hadn't really heated up. You know? Right. This is still, in your mind, from what you're seeing on the news, like a police action type of thing, right? Never even knew it was going on. <laughs> <laughs> and there was other stuff going on. The Cold War was at its height. Yeah. People are looking at Europe, China, Cuban, uh, the Dominican Republic. The Marines were there at the Cuban time. Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. That was the big one. So you go to boot camp when uh, that August, or did you wait? I uh, signed up in August. We went in... October. We went on a delayed buddy deal. All five of you? Yeah. Did you go to the same? All in the same platoon boot camp. That's awesome. Was that common? Or were you guys like there the were, biggest group? There were friends? others that had, you know, one or two, but not five. It was five of us. It been may have been, or it may have made boot camp hotter, actually, when you stop and think about it. Now, yeah, with your four buddies, you don't want to look like a wimp. <laughs> that could be a good thing. You know, so you, you push yourself a little harder, I think. There's no anonymity when you're by yourself at boot camp. That well, when nobody knows you. got you, your four but... buddies, you know, yeah. word could get back home yeah, to the people you know. And if you were a tough guy back home, you could kind of melt away in boot camp. You had to gut it out. But at the same time, them being your friends, it was probably also comforting, right? Like you had somebody to commiserate with. Yeah. Now, who was now Brad Brad Fields was he was only two guys down from me in, in line for some reason. I was one bunk, skip a bunk, he was in the next bunk down. Same thing with Eddie Goulet. So describe that that's like a squad bay and on both sides, starboard and port oh, side. It's, it's a wide yeah. open bunk wide beds open on both sides. Platoon squad bay. And when no you privacy. Think about it, you think about the movie, everybody thinks about the movie Full Metal Jacket, it looks just like that, right? Yeah, that's just exactly what it looks like. Wide yeah. open squad bay. I mean, and they're the same squad base that, shit, I went Forever. down. Forever. Yeah, yeah they've always been there on Paris Island. Although we we were in 3rd Battalion. 3rd Battalion was new. It was all brick buildings. On Paris Island, you have 1st and 2nd bat Training Battalions. They're right at the parade deck. They're right front and center. Everything goes on around them. But then 3rd Battalion is kind of off in the woods a little bit. It's, it's off a little ways, yeah. But again, it was, it would, they were new buildings. They were all brick. And again, the other there was there was three battalions. The other two battalions, they call them battalion. They really weren't. The other two battalions were in squad in in Quonset huts. Seen Quonset huts? Strange. Yeah. Because when I went through, they were big. They must have been built around the Vietnam time because they were both brick right in front of the parade deck. Yeah. See, they weren't that way before. They were Quonset huts. They before. were Quonset huts. And so the ones you were training in the brick ones, they became rifle range barracks at boot camp when I was there. So they were across from the rifle range. They were the old third battalion. That's where we stayed for two weeks while we were at the rifle range. Yeah. Um, but very old, no no stalls, all the toilets just Oh yeah, it was, it's wide open. No privacy. Wide open. Yep. Community shower. Which is which is part if of you, the... If you were shy, you had a big problem. <laughs> right. Or you learned not to be shy real fast because you didn't have an option. What do you remember about your DIs? What I remember about them, we had the lead DI that was a gunny sergeant. He was kind of mellow. We had another DI who was the good guy. We had another one that was the bad guy. And we had the fourth one that was crazy. <laughs> he was out of his mind. He really was. He would call Cadence, and he couldn't call Cadence. And he'd get pissed. We were all out of step, making all kinds of mistakes. <laughs> We had a crazy one, Sergeant Sergeant Cody. We'd be standing there with our chrome domes on, at attention. He would get up on the top bunk, and he'd go from bunk to bunk, and he'd lift you up by the helmet <laughs> and let you go. <laughs> he was out of his mind. Could you smoke when you went through boot camp? Yeah. Yep. You see, there was a lot of guys that didn't smoke, but when the smoke lamp was lit, in order to get out, I smoke, and out the door they go. <laughs> I think a lot of people learn in the military that yeah. when they say smoke break, if you're standing around because you're a non-smoker, you're going to get snatched up for a working party. They're going to find something for you to do. they're going to find something for you to do. Yeah. And everybody learns quick in the Marine Corps. Be busy or else you'll be put to work. Yeah. 
Yep, you had the, the bucket in the middle, and it had a circle all the way around it. And heaven forbid you leave a cigarette butt on the ground. One guy's job was to make sure there was no cigarettes. Yeah. There was no smoking allowed when I went through boot camp. No. Fine. So you graduate boot camp, no, no major problems there? Any, anything like Well, yeah. <laughs> what did you find we were, challenging? We were in formation. They were, were practicing drill. I'm standing in the formation, right shoulder arms, and this sling came loose. So rather than just leave it alone, I tried to fix it and got caught. <laughs> That was running from where we were to the dumpster and back, which was probably a good hundred yards, and I had five seconds to do it. Obviously, you're not going to do it. So after the fourth time, I just lost it, and I said, go fuck yourself. <laughs> How'd that play out? I spent the last two weeks of my life in boot camp living out of my sea bag. <laughs> which means that you had to carry everything with you all the time. Everything was in the sea bag. There was no no foot locker, no wall locker. It's a good way to punish somebody who doesn't want to conform. Everything I had was in that bag. So every time I had to get something, I had to go to the whole bag, take what I needed, put it all back in, and it had to be neat. And if you took too long doing it now, they could dump your sea bag. Oh, they would do that anyway. Yeah. It didn't matter. It's the same thing with the foot lockers. You know the routine. They find one guy that's got something wrong in the foot locker, they dump everybody's foot locker. Now, did you plan on being an infantryman, or, or is that something they assigned you? No, I didn't, you? didn't have a choice. It was, it was just what I was assigned. There were some guys that, when they signed up, they were pre-positioned to go into a certain MOS. Engineers, mechanics. Yeah, whatever it might be. Uh, the rest of it was transport. all just, just random. It was me, Eddie Goulet, Gary Maynard. I think I said Bobby Maynard before. Gary Maynard. And stands to power. We all went infantry. Brad, six foot four, two hundred and twenty pounds, was a cook. <laughs> Figure that out. <laughs> so, how did you feel when you you know graduated boot camp? Was it eight weeks then, or was it more? Was it twelve still? Boot camp back then. How many weeks was it? Uh, I think it was eight back then. Well, it was normally 13, right? Yeah. You know, we did either eight or 10. I'm not, well, October. I don't know. I don't remember. Whatever it was, it was about nine weeks too long. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go after boot camp? Went to Camp Lejeune. And that was for? That was, I was with uh, Charlie Company 1-6, Infantry Company. Before that, though, you didn't go to SOI or infantry oh, we school? Oh, we went to ITR, but that's, that's kind of considered part of boot camp. So, mm -hmm. they, they call that what? Advanced infantry training? But it AIT, or, or they call it the School of Infantry? He didn't learn or anything. Or the Marine Combat Training? He didn't learn anything. I mean, it was the same thing at boot camp. You go to the class, and you sit and you listen, you watch what they're doing. You're going to learn the infantry. You ain't going to learn it in a book. Yeah. This is really where they just get you humping getting used to carrying a pack and, and just marching, right? That's it. That's, that's basically what you do. Were you ever concerned that like, you weren't learning enough about tactics, or did you feel you would learn yeah. that once you got into your regiment? I don't think you really ever thought about that. I mean, you weren't... You didn't realize that at some point in the near future you were going to the big rifle range. It didn't really register. You didn't even think about that. So, no, I, I think it was, it was just basically... Book work, mostly, and hikes and, and those kinds of things. You know, out of boot camp, they had what? They have what now? What do they call it now? The, the crucible? The crucible. Back then, we had a three-day war. You'd go out for three days, camp out, and run ambushes and those kinds of things. Yeah, you would, you know, they, would, they would do ambushes. You'd do patrols. You'd go out as a, a whole group on an operation of something. So you finish up with the, the small infantry school, and then you get assigned to the 2nd Marine Division, which is in Camp Lejeune. Camp Lejeune, Charlie Company 1-6. I was there. We went on a med cruise, which was amazing. Maybe two months two months after getting there, we got assigned to a med cruise. So that was, a, it's just shot of six months. But we hit all the islands. 
So this is a Marine Expeditionary Unit that goes with the Navy. Your yep. battalion goes on a boat, and this was a Mediterranean cruise. So you guys patrolled the Mediterranean, yeah. and then you guys would stop at different ports, do some training exercises. I remember at that time, too, Israel was hating up. I thought it was kind of strange. We were on the island of Crete, and they brought us all together, and they talked about being ordered to shoot somebody. They wanted to know if anybody thought they couldn't do that. Of course, you're not going to say, no, I can't do that. Oh, yeah, I can. I'll shoot the son of a bitch. <laughs> but I think that was part of it. I think they were concerned that Israel was going to have a big problem. What war was that? Uh, the, that was 1967. Was it the, there was Yom Kippur, but there was also like the Seven Day War. I forget where they fought Egypt. It was one I, of those? I'm not 100 percent sure. Don't know which one it was, but, but uh, it had to be the one where Israel got attacked by what three, four different companies, countries rather. So it had to be in that time frame somewhere. And that was really the only time that they they had a big problem. And I wonder if they were thinking about going in or if they would have to go in. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. On every island that we went to, we did an amphibious landing. You took the shoreline, then we went to a, a camping area. And from there, you'd go on hikes and do this and do that and do the other thing. Did you think you were going to go to Nam, or did you think that you were just going to... Oh, I knew eventually. It was coming. It was coming. Were they saying anything to you guys, like... After this, well, they, they say it all the time. Off. You know, yeah. keep screwing up like that, and you're going to die. <laughs> it, was, it was the usual tactic. Try to get you to snap out of your pig-headedness. Pay attention. <clears throat> Other than that, though, was it fun? Was it a fun cruise? I mean, it was fun. Today, the yeah, it was, it, was, it was totally different. So how did you get orders to Vietnam then after the cruise? Well, we, we came back, and it wasn't two days later. They put us into an, uh, a Vietnam training battalion. We were issued M16s because we had the M14 prior to that. And it was, it was mainly working with the rifle, target shooting, that kind of stuff, hand grenades, you know, the usual weapons that you might use in combat. Got to fire a grenade launcher. What is that? M22, M73? M79. Thumper? Yep, and fired a law rocket. How'd you feel about the law? It, it, you know, it seemed right. I fired it once in Vietnam. We had this hooch surrounded, not surrounded, but on a couple of sides of it. There were people in there. I happened to be carrying one, so they wanted to fire into the hooch. Well, I fired, yeah, it went. In this side, not the other side. <laughs> it, it, because it, the funny it, thing is, the law guys were carrying that out in the jungle, out in the rice paddies, but it was designed as an anti-tank weapon. Yep. So there's a lot of velocity behind that rocket, and it's it's probably meant to hit steel, not yeah. It's meant to thatch. hit something something solid. I mean, it went right through the thatch like it wasn't even there. <laughs> out the other side and went into a berm or something. Yep, I don't know where it went after that. You just kind of hang your head in shame, you know. God damn. <laughs> so did you? Get leave before they finally sent you to Vietnam? Yeah, we had a, what, 30 day leave. Another interesting, dumb story on my part. I had to be in California 2400 on a particular date. So I'm thinking civilian time. So on the 22nd, I got there at 2400, which was actually the 23rd. <laughs> I was late. <laughs> All the guys from my company that were they they were already gone. They were already gone in Okinawa. You were AWOL. Well, that's the last they didn't give a shit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they didn't say anything. I said, hey, you know, I just screwed up. So from there, you went from what? Pendleton straight to Vietnam? How'd you get there? Or did you go Pendleton, up to Pendleton, Okinawa? San Francisco? Okinawa was the stop. Spent a, I don't know, about a week there, I guess. They had the dreaded formation every night. 1900, they would call off the names, the guys that were going the next day. You got to, oh, please don't call my name. <laughs> Not today, maybe tomorrow. But, you know, if you're going as a unit, you know the people around you. If you're going by yourself, you're going into a group of guys that have been there, and most likely they know what they're doing, and you know nothing. 
You right. think you know, but you really don't know. <laughs> I mean, to me, that adds a whole other component to the stress that you're under. You're going to war, but on top of it, you're going as a new guy who has no friends. I had, you know, it, it's interesting. I had people talk about that. Uh, they were intimidated. They were this. I, I didn't feel that way. I mean, I, I was, like anybody else, I had my concerns. A little kind of hesitant, a little scared when you first get there. But everybody's like that. After a while, you kind of fit in, and you get to the point where you say, yeah, just another day, man. I go out, do some hunting, come back for lunch. <laughs> you know? Do you think the fact that you had already been in the Marine Corps for six months, you'd seen how it operated, you'd, um, you'd um, gone on a Mediterranean cruise? We hear a lot of stories about guys that just go from boot camp to Vietnam. Yep, I think that was a big factor. As I say, everybody's scared when you get there, but eventually, it may sound ridiculous, but you get used to it. So the day they finally call your name, what 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 happened? What yeah, do they say? What, 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 uh, how does that work? Oh, uh, shit. <laughs> you knew it was coming. Just a matter of time. So you just go back, get all your stuff ready, get all packed up, catch the plane the next day, go to Okinawa. Once again, you're a bunch of people you don't know. You, know? you just, just try to try to fit in. You listen to what's going on. You pay attention. More so than you normally would probably. But you know where you're going next. How did you get to Vietnam? How did I get there? Mm -hmm. With a, a civilian aircraft, civilian plane. Da Nang went to, they had a name for the base, but that's where you go to get assigned to a particular unit. Yep. You end up in the first one? Mike 37. Anybody so we else went, in that group get we sent to Mike 37 with you? There was another kid. I didn't know him, I didn't know his name. The two of us went down there. And that's an interesting story. We get assigned, front placement. We go to, I'm not sure which hill again. They did, they, they, I think it was Battalion Hill, which would have been what, 55? 55 was uh, third, uh, third Battalion. Okay, so that's where we went. This is the Marine Corps. This is the way they do things. Me and this other kid, we're trained infantry. So what do they do with us? Put us in a mortar platoon. Happy as hell. All right, this is good. We'll just have to hump all this stuff around. We'll have to worry about all this other shit. Well, as fate would have it, they had two mortarmen in the infantry and two infantry in the mortar. End of your good time, brother. Off you go. <laughs> How long did you make it as a mortarman? Before About two the... weeks. And then they said, hey, you're going with the... Yeah. the, the Listen, uh, we, we got some mortarmen coming over letters. here. You guys got to go to the infantry. So you leave Hill 55, like you said, on a convoy? Yeah, we, we drove there in a truck. Went to Hill 52. No, that's Hill 52 is where my company's um, company headquarters that's was. Their, that's their base camp. And that was the, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the farthest west Marine company in yep. the 1st Marine Division in Southern I-4. Yep. We were on the edge of the TAOR. Tactical Area of Responsibility. Yep. Out past us, there was a Special Forces camp. But we were the first, the furthest Marine unit. I believe we were, we were 20 miles southwest of Da Nang. And this other outpost is called Stanley Looker. They were about another mile out. Oh, we, like. we had little everything. We had, mostly around us were rice paddies. Okay, and then you go a little closer to the mountains and you start to get a woodsy area. And then you hit the jungle. So across the river was the old Arizona area, that was mostly rice paddies. So we were on pretty flat land. We didn't spend a lot of time in the jungles. What are some of the things that you were surprised about or some of the experiences that you weren't quite expecting when you first got to your company? Well, the, 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 I think the biggest thing, and that's probably the biggest thing for everybody, is when you get into your first firefight and it's total chaos from your point of view. Oh, it's being fired, everybody running around, yelling and screaming, you know, you just, you, you've never experienced before. 
So naturally, it's a bit of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, well, I went through the normal progression. You start off as Taylor and Charlie. You're at the back of the squad. After a few days, they move you to the front, and then you're the point man for a while. Uh, probably after about a month, they made me, Jerry made me a team leader. Me and three other guys, yeah. And you report to your squad leader. Yep. So you're in charge of three guys? There's four of you in the fire team? Yeah, it's four of us in the fire team. The leader and, and three other guys. I was the low man on the totem pole as far as fire team leaders go. So if something happened, you know, it would be the first team leader, then the second team leader, then the third team leader. On paper, it works that way. In reality, it may not work that way. The person that's got the most experience would be the person that would take over, regardless right. of rank, regardless of position. How did you feel about your squad leader? Did you like him? Or? Jerry, Jerry is a good guy. Jerry, he saved us a couple of times. We got into a big mess. He wasn't one of these people that would run around and snap and yell and scream and holler. He didn't have to. Everybody respected him. Everybody knew that he knew what he was doing, and he proved it more than one time. So when he said something, you just did it. You didn't ask questions. Interesting stories from Jerry Chong is, you know, he always described himself as, you know, I was more of the the thinker, the laid back squad leader, but his best friend, the other squad leader, McCrossin, was the more aggressive. He was crazy. Uh, <laughs> get after it. I just want to go to the brawl and I want to throw fists type of guy. The first time I met McCrossin, we were on an operation. I don't know how I ended up or how we ended up in the area that he was in. But he had a man down. His radio man didn't have any smoke. Throw so smoke out so the chopper could see it. He was beating him on his helmet with the rifle. That he was nuts. <laughs> I, oh, next time you get tipped, we ain't got any smoke. <laughs> and it was generally the radio man's responsibility to carry smokes. Yeah. Well, so everybody, could... everybody had smoke, but it was definitely the radio man's responsibility. Did uh, did you guys have designations for the colors or? No, that well, other than red. Red was full any enemy contract, you're in big trouble. It's a, the, chopper, the chopper pilot would just request smoke and you'd throw out whatever you had and he would identify it. Did you ever carry the radio when you were there? On some shock patrols I did. We went off 52 one day, they found a bomb that had not exploded. So there were four of us went out. We went out with, the leader was a sergeant I think he was like right guy, right guide or something like that. He didn't run a squad. So we went out to where it was. I gotta admit the guy had nerve. We went out to where it was, reported it. They said to blow it in place. So he went out, set the charges, came back. It didn't go off. Now somebody's gotta go out there and check it, see what the hell's wrong. He went out, didn't think nothing about it, went right out there, and eventually blew it up. And you guys came across unexploded ordnance all the time. I don't know where, I don't know whether we came across it or a civilian came across. Somebody reported an unexploded, unexploded bomb. You know, we weren't that close. Other than the sergeant that was going to set the charge, we weren't that close to it. I don't know how big a bomb it was. It had to be a 250 anyway. That would blow a pretty big hole. Yeah. And this is occurring because airstrikes or artillery rounds quite often they have duds yeah, and duds. so yep. with the millions of rounds they're dropping there are potentially thousands of unexploded ordnance everywhere just lying out there find them everywhere and if you don't find them the enemy will and then they can use that against you yeah, they will make booby traps out of them what do they call them EID. IEDs now? I -E Improvised Explosive Improvised Device. Improvised Explosive Device. But back then you guys just called them booby traps. Simply a booby trap. Step into it, you're in big trouble. So go back to your first contact. You're on that patrol. Do you remember how that kicked off? Did they well, find you guys? Did you find them? Or? The first contact was Operation Citrus. We had been out patrolling around. We came into this clearing. We set up around the clearing. We were sitting there, and then we saddled up, move out. As soon as we stood up, rifle fire. 
they were out there in the woods somewhere and they started shooting. I remember hitting the ground and doing this kind of a thing. And I got bullets. <laughs> Scared shitless. And that, what do you do? That was only, I had only been there for what? A month. Never been shot at. We seemed to set up in an area where they were hiding. I don't know if they came in after we set up or they had been there previously. But as soon as we stood up to move, they started firing. Nobody got hit. They missed everybody. But that was my first baptism of fire, and it was scary. <laughs> and, and what's going on around you? Do you remember I who's no taking idea. charge? I have no idea. I'm busy watching these bullets bouncing all around the place. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. you got to remember, this is a whole company we're talking about. We're, yeah. we're a company set up there. 360 perimeter, perimeter waiting for orders to do whatever we we're going to do. You have rounds hitting your location. Yeah. Well, it, it seemed like they were shooting every round at me. <laughs> yeah, right? It's much, it's personal. <laughs> you know, they're out to get me, I know they are. I don't know how that, I think they just stopped shooting. And that was the end of it. It was, it was, bing, 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 rounds all over the place, then it just stopped. So you think that was more of just the target of opportunity? I think so. Shot we happened to set up where they were. But we've been chasing guys for two days. It was a situation where we were after these three guys. We're a company online. It was a, a wooded area. I wouldn't call it a heavy forest, but it was it was a wooded area. We we're online and we're moving forward because they're in front of us. Well, the first booby trap goes off and somebody gets hit. Now what? <laughs> Watching every step. You're, you're paying more attention to the ground than you are to what's in front of you. The last thing you want to do is step out a booby trap and blow your leg off. You, you're looking at the ground, you're looking ahead of you, you're looking to where you're going to go if the bullets start to fly, and then take another step, and then you do the same thing, and another step, and do the same thing. It, 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 it's, it's a mind game, and they know it. That's why they do it. <laughs> you know. And I don't think that these booby traps were there. I think they were setting them up as they moved forward. But we eventually got them. Rocket Man he had the old, the actual, what the, it wasn't a bazooka, what do we call them in the Marine Corps? Carl Gustav? A rocket, it must have been a rocket. Uh, was it like the 3.5 rocket? It must have been. The Rocket Man got him. Was, um, how we, many Rocket Men did you have in the platoon, one? Well, just the one, I, you know, I didn't even know we had that. We had one Rocket Man. What did the Army have? You know, they had... Smaller versions, easy to carry. This thing was a big, huge, gigantic tube. I think it folded in half. And when they were going to fire it, they had to put it together. They had to put the round in the back. They had to wire it up and fire it off. Yeah, by then it's too late. <laughs> you know? Now, on uh, the uh, patrol you were on, you said after a month, uh, where you had the law. How did how did that play out? How do you remember that playing out? Again, uh, that that was all this stuff happened on the same operation, the Operation Citrus, which I guess was a big deal. It didn't seem like it at the time, and we were hitting people here, hitting there. There were no huge firefights, little sporadic fights here and there. I don't know. We were just patrolling along, and and, and somehow somebody saw these people run into their hooch. They partially surrounded it, and they started pouring fire on it. They wanted somebody to fire a law, and I said, I'll do it. I want to get rid of this thing. It's a pain. <laughs> you know? I hit the hooch, but unfortunately, it went right through it. How, did, uh, how do you operate the law? How, did, how does that work? Did you have to extend it? Yeah, it, it's, it's compacted. There's a button, a rocker-type switch, and you pull it out. Okay, the, the round and everything is already in there. You have to take it off safe. You have a sight, similar to an old rifle sight. The front, you got the back one that's elevated up and down. You take it off safe and you just fire it. That's it. Pretty simple. It's kind of weird, you know, the first time, the first time I fired one way back on on the med crews, it was, it was kind of weird because you don't really know what you're doing. You put it out, you put it all together, and watch me, I'm cool, man. <laughs> hit a rock, I hit that rock, I got it. 
what was the, uh, besides Citrus, which was your first big operation, what was the daily tempo like? What was patrolling like? How did it work? Who stayed back? Who went on patrols? Who did the night ambushes? How it, did that work? It rotated around the patrol. You had a day of patrol, a night ambush, a listening post, and hole watch. And it would just rotate around on that basis. One day you do the patrol, the next day you do something else. It would just cool. But that did yeah, that didn't just rotate between a platoon. It rotated between the whole company. So the first platoon would have an ambush that night. Second platoon would have the listening post. Third platoon would have the night watch and something else. And it, it just it would just go round and round and round. It didn't, the routine didn't get interrupted very often. What was life like on Hill 52, living there? It was different. Uh, it, it's, we had a shower. The shower, we, they had 55 gallon drums up on, on stilts and the sun would heat it up during the day. If you weren't the first one to get there, then you ended up with cold water. <laughs> How often would you get a In shower? In all honesty, I'm going to venture, if we took a shower a month while we were on the hill or out in the field, that would be a lot. <laughs> no showers. We ain't doing showers. No haircuts. Shave if you feel like it. <laughs> the captain was pretty good. He didn't care. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't push the petty stuff. Yeah. Who was your captain at the time? Do you remember? Yes, I do. It wasn't Porter, was it? Porter was there when I first got there. And then his time was up, and he left, and another captain came in. and I Hold away? Uh, Hold away? Hold away, yep. And he was the captain for the whole time I was there. Uh, tell me about the Arizona. You guys are just across the river from the infamous Arizona Territory, which they got the reputation of being always a shootout whenever you guys went in there. Is that yeah. what made it so? It, it, that was their main base camp area. All right. They would come in off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, come up into Charlie Ridge up in the mountains. At night, they would cross over to the other side, which was their base camp, their resupply area. They would spend the day there. The next night, they'd come back. So that was just a constant, and you, you, you could see them from the hill. You could see them over there. But that was their main rest and rack relaxation area, their main resupply area. They had everything over there you could imagine. They had huge bunkers. They had tunnels. They had all kinds in of stuff. In the Arizona. In the Arizona. And, uh, they, they were prepared to fight a fight at any level they had to. They had a lot of people over there. And Every time we went over there, we would get into big firefights. Was it the fact that there were so many villages there that gave them the, the opportunity to blend in with the, the populace? or Because it seems like it's all rice paddy. It, it, basically, both sides of the river are the same. It's, it's mostly rice paddies. You've got just slightly wooded areas. And then if you go to the north on the other side, you get into the mountains. Because the valley is almost encircled by mountains, as are most valleys in the whole country. They, that was just that was their area, and they would defend it to the death. So every time they went over there, you could expect trouble. And again, I'm assuming because it's the farthest west that the Marines were, that butted up to where you're both going to meet each other, right? Because to the west of your position, it's almost they have free reign; they can move back and forth. But the Arizona is where the edge of the Marine Corps. In Southern I Corps and the and the uh, NVA and or Viet Cong kind of seem to meet right there. Yep, that's been mostly as, as I said that they, they were defending that area. They considered that to be theirs, and we came over. We were intruding. You got to remember too that Charlie Ridge was part of the Da Nang rocket belt. They would fire a lot of missiles off that ridge into Da Nang. It was we would make contact every night. Ambushes going off every night, every night, every night, getting more and more and more and more. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't stop 
but it slows right down. So that's the point where they were building up for Tet. But we didn't realize at the time. We thought we were just kicking their ass. You know? I don't think we really realized that that was going on. It, uh, I mean, we were so used to what we were doing. As I said before, it was, it was a job. You'd go out there, and it didn't matter if there was three, ten, or twenty. It, it, it made no difference. It was a contact. That was it. You didn't even take numbers into consideration. Just figured we happened to hit a big patrol out there, or they were going for a big ambush. They were going to take over a village. You never realized that it was a buildup. More and more and more people. In our area, we didn't really have anything big happen. There was it was the usual ambushes. It was, it was life as usual, no changes. I remember the night of Tet. I was out with uh, McCrossin Squad doing guard for a bridge, a small bridge that was back there. And I remember being in the hall with with uh, Gene when he got the word that there were attacks all over the country. So we sat there all night, nothing happened. So you're on patrol and your squad leader, McCrossin, Gene McCrossin, he hears over the radio that there are large attacks yep. on major installations all over the country. So they're probably just like, what, be aware, be That's advised. all, it was just, you know, be on alert, we could get a hit. I mean, it was a small nothing bridge, really. Their whole plan was to attack the big cities thinking that the people would rise up and join forces with them, which they didn't do. Right. It's, that's and why their idea it. was to take over the country. That was supposed to be their ultimate goal. The name of their operation was the General Offensive General Uprising, yep. hoping that the people wanted them to succeed and would take up arms and help yep. them. That it, did not happen. It did. Um, so why did you guys, you guys eventually pull off at Hill 52 because of Tet? They pulled us off. Um, the word we were given was that they were coming down to take over the hill. And the hill itself was actually non-defendable. We had a road, the road that came up, went into uh, the Special Forces camp further down. The road came up like this, came right up into the hill. So they had a pre-cut road to go right in there if they wanted to. We, we would have depended on helicopters and, and jets. This is a small outpost on yep. the far west periphery of the Marines' tactical area of responsibility. So, at the same time, it's also because, correct me if I'm wrong, Marines all over your TAOR uh, are getting pulled into those major fights. I know the 5th Marines are also in your area. They're getting sent up to Way. Um, yep. So you guys are basically now the battalion's quick reaction force. We don't have a home. We wander around, they, they, wherever the uh, extra troops are needed, that's where they would send us. We never got into any major fights. Uh, we would go where there was an operation that went bad. Something happened, they were having a problem, and we would go in to reinforce them. That was our main deal, was to reinforce people in contact. Yeah. So, as, as the map shows, we were all over that area. That's, that's mostly where we stayed. Okay. Up until Tet. Yeah, we we, we well we pulled they pulled us back to Hill 65, which is here somewhere. I'm not sure where. So they brought you closer to Da Nang. Yep. Um, you uh, guys abandoned Hill 52. Hill 25 had already been abandoned, and now the yep. next farthest west outpost is it's, Hill. Was Hill, 65, Hill 65, which was um, an artillery hill. Yeah, we 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 stayed there for a couple of my nights, and then we just started to roam. We were still out in the I think they pulled us back to Hill 55, was that battalion? They pulled us back to 55. We spent a night there. And then the next night, they trucked us down. They trucked us down at the here somewhere. All dropped right, so. us off, and then we, we walked down into what they called Dodge City. Why they call it Dodge City, I have no idea. Yeah, well, that, um, that was more woods and some areas with heavy, heavy foliage. It wasn't as, as wide Less open. Less paddy, right? It wasn't as wide open as this area was. As I understand it, we were a blocking force 
for the army. You're in this area somewhere. I don't know whether we're coming southeast or, or north, north, southwest or northeast. I don't know what, what does we're, it mean. I don't know what we're blocking. We're what, blocking. Describe something. what a blocking force is when you guys get used to blocking force. A blocking force would be an operation where you would set up, not necessarily in a line, but in an area, and the other units would try to drive the enemy towards you. Your idea was to block them, not let them get by. And hopefully ambush them in their retreat? Yeah, because we ran ambushes during the day. They ran, uh, excuse me, ran patrols during the day. They ran ambushes at night. Always had listening posts out, which in my opinion is the most scariest thing you can do. You got three posts. guys out 100 yards or so, all by yourself. You got a radio, but you got all these people in front of you. <laughs> How do you hide from them? If they find you, you're dead. I was on, my I spent two nights on a listing post. The first night was uneventful, and I had a couple of guys that were from my fire team. The next one, we had two new guys to the company, and this, uh, Jerry Chong had gone. We had a new, a new squad leader. He thought it was a good idea to send me out with these two brand new guys. Brand new, been in company country one day. They know nothing. <laughs> so we're going to go out 100 yards and we're going to sit there and, and wait for them. And these guys are up there. I'm nervous. They're scared to death. And I don't blame them. It's, it's, it's so scary. It's unbelievable. You're sitting there at night. Every sound is like a truck is running through the area, everything is amplified. You know, your, your senses are amplified, so you, you hear these sounds even clearer. They seem to be a lot louder than they are. You want to call it a hole somewhere, but you can't because you've got to stay there and watch what's going on. I spent the whole night wide awake. <laughs> I did not go to sleep. I let these other guys sleep. I couldn't trust them because I didn't know them. And, and they hadn't been in country long enough. So listening posts are an LP. You're out 100 yards in front of whatever line your squad, platoon, yep. or company is in. And your job is to alert. Everybody, sooner or later, goes on an LP. And uh, I can only imagine, you have experience, so like you said, they're scared, but you're nervous because not only are you going on something that a seasoned veteran is always nervous to go on because you have to ha be at the top of your game, but you also have to teach, calm, and reassure these new guys yep. that you know what you're doing to make sure that they don't completely um, fall apart. Really? And, uh, if you're out there with, with people that you know and people that you normally work with, it's not so bad because you trust them. And you know what the you other guys You know what doing. they're going to yes. do. When you've got two brand new guys, they've been in country one, maybe two days at the most in this particular situation, they don't know anything. They don't even know how to load their rifle. Okay, <laughs> you're going to be sitting there sleeping when they're on watch, you know. I mean, when you first get there, you're dog tired. You're not used to being up half the night. You're not used to doing all these things. You know, you're coming from the rear where you're getting your eight hours sleep and you got the, the, the bar is open and all this good stuff. Now you're out here in the, in the real world and you know nothing. And there's so many physical factors, and that's what I find so interesting about the Vietnam War is... You're patrolling all the time. You're physically tired. There are all sorts of ailments and sicknesses yep. that you guys are getting. You're a little bit emaciated. You're, you've got ringworm and hookworm and uh, malaria, all these issues. You're, you've got skin sores <laughs> uh, just from the climate eating away at your flesh, any cut. So you're hurting all the time. I'm sure your hands are all cut up. Your feet hurt. On top of that, there's the stress and the fear. I can only imagine that when you get on an LP, the adrenaline's pumping, but that's a that's a 10-hour night, 12-hour night. Eventually, yep. your adrenaline depletes, and all of those, you know, fear really adds to making you more tired. That's and what it is. You, once, you once, must get so dog-tired. Once the adrenaline stops pumping, you know. Yep. It must be hard to... You get to three o'clock in the morning, it must be very hard to be awake. It, it, eventually you crash, you know, the adrenaline stops and you just can't keep your eyes open. You're fighting it all the time. Yep, 
I got to Vietnam, I weighed 166 pounds. When I came back, I was 135 pounds. So I lost 30 pounds. And every, everybody loses weight. Uh, Nobody gains weight in a combat zone. Unless you're in the rear somewhere, you know. How hard was it to avoid getting sick? Actually, I only had one, one time. All right, and it was after the first operation. I came back, I had a ringworm. I had parasites. I had a bacterial infection. Went to the went to Coleman and, and they gave me some kerosene pills. At least they tasted like kerosene. I fell asleep a few hours. I got up and I was fine. It was over. And I really never got sick after that. You know, on Hill 52, they had Corman was set up. They had a little area. They had a little hooch. You'd go and you tell them what your problem was. They'd look at it. They'd give you what they thought they needed. You most of the time was just hit. Antibiotics. Take this aspirin, you'll be fine. Yeah. You know. So you're going into the Tet Offensive, recovering from parasites and all that stuff. Uh, for two weeks, you guys are traveling around, working as a blocking force in Dodge City, just south of Battalion Headquarters, Hill 55. Um, talk about those two weeks and then the lead up to uh, a major ambush that you guys triggered. Actually, it was just two weeks of sleeping out, never have enough water, eating sea rations. I don't know if, if you ever ate sea rations, but they're horrible. Spam would taste good compared to some of this stuff. So for the first two weeks of tech, you're not really getting major contacts? On yeah, we really had siege. nothing to speak of. I mean, you had the usual ambush here, ambush there, that kind of a thing. You went on patrols, you really didn't see very much. Cause they just weren't in our area. You know, they were further to the north. Now, during the Tet Offensive in early February, there's a rocket attack um, that I read in the command chronologies where the enemy set up rockets, 122 millimeter rockets in Dodge City. They fired them onto battalion headquarters, Hill 55. Um, and it seems like then you guys are sent out to find those rocket emplacements. I, I just had that thought of, um, you know, if that happened at that time, and we went there as a blocking force for a pretty big operation, well, then, then that would make sense to be there. They're looking for the rockets. Yep. That's that's one thing that the NVA and the V or the VC have that can do yeah. some serious damage. You got to remember when they sent us out on an operation, they didn't sit down and say, "Well, we're going to do this, and tomorrow we're going here, and then we're going there." The average guy in the squad didn't have that information. What we dealt with the squad leader. Wow. The squad leader would go up. They'd have their meeting and discuss whatever they're going to discuss, and he could come back and he would tell us what we were going to do. Usually he didn't know why or tell us why. It's just, we're going here, we got an ambush set up over here, and we got another one over here. And that's all you would get. They would call a meeting. It would be the platoon commander, the right guide, if you had one, the platoon sergeant, and the squad leaders. They would go to the meeting and discuss whatever they discussed come back down to us through our squad leader. Uh, we got an ambush tonight, we're going over here, we're gonna spend the night there. In the morning on the way back, we're gonna circle around this way and see what's going on. And that's it, you, had, you didn't really even get the hows, the whys, and the what for us. What sticks out to you, um, is it February 13th? February 12th and 13th, February 12th, the 13th. Uh, one of the squads from your platoon goes into that rocket attack area in Dodge City uh, and they come across some females and evidence that there was an enemy medical camp or aid station. They, they capture or kill uh, two or three nurses that are fleeing from the, the base. And then what happens on the 13th? On the 13th, Jerry got the orders to run a patrol. So we headed out and we headed toward this particular village. Uh, I remember when we got, just before we got to the village, there was, there was a ramp leading into the village. I don't recall if there was water running under it or if it was a pool or what it was. But you had to go up this ramp and it wasn't a pool, it was just a small incline to get you off the rice paddies up into the village itself. It's a dirt ramp? It, it was made out of dirt. And somebody 
set off a concussion grenade. Uh, a concussion grenade is a gr grenade that doesn't have any shrapnel in it. It just goes off, makes a loud noise. So that alerted us that there was some kind of a problem going on here. So we go past that, we get up into the village, and the first hoosh we run into is what appeared to be an NVA recruiting station. There were NVA flags all over the place, there was literature all over the place. And we saw that, and we, our, our, our senses were heightened to start with because of the grenade. Now we see this, now we're more alert than we were before. We know there's, there's something going on here. So we start following the trail down through the village. We get to an area where there's a bend in the curve. And one of the guys happened to notice a cartridge belt that wasn't U.S., it was NVA, was laying there. Okay. We didn't go and get it, we just left it there because we didn't know what it was. So the trail continued around that bend, it straightened out, and then it took another bend. And at that point, we had a man who was out in front, uh, and he, oh, we heard fire. He opened fire on what he said was a group of eight to ten guys. He came back, and then we were, we were there trying to decide, Jerry's trying to decide what to do, and then the shooting started. So we were next to a cane field. So we go into the cane fields for cover, and they're dropping mortars on us. So now we're in a, well, we, we, I want to, I'm, I'm using the word panic, but I don't mean panic. We're concerned <laughs> you know, that something big is going on. And we were pinned there for, I'm going to guess, a half an hour. We had one guy took a round on the chest, and he died. Uh, nobody else got hurt at that point in time. But the rest of the company, came in to reinforce us. Uh, at the time, we didn't know it, but we ran into a, a major NVA unit. They had mortars, they had machine guns, they had everything you could say. If you read, if you read through the after action reports, it says a reinforced squad. Well, it was more than a squad. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was more than a platoon, to be more. So we were taking fire from a wood line ahead of us. Jerry called in. The, 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 the jets, and he told them where he wanted to drop the, the bombs. He dropped them off to our left, maybe a hundred meters. All right, and called Jerry Squatch. He dropped them in the wrong place. He said, "No, they were a group of about 50 guys coming towards you," and he had, he had hit them. So if 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 he hadn't dropped those bombs there, I don't know what would have happened. It would have been 50 against 10. <laughs> it would have been a big problem. Well, before you guys fell back for cover into the cane field, um, and your point guy opened up on um, that squad of enemy. What, how did you guys get out of there? Did, from what he describes, uh, you guys kind of leapfrogged back yeah, his I'm entire not, I'm, team? I'm not sure how Jerry got the word. I'm sure, I'm assuming he got all over the radio that the company was in the area. And we just kind of fell back retraced our steps back into the village and at some point we tied up with them. And, and the Marine that was killed was not from your fire team? No, he was not. Black, Black Steen, I think. Black Steen? Yeah. Um, he was shot in the chest, wounded, and Jerry was trying to get a medevac for him out? Yeah, well, you know, the Colmo was trying to patch him up. I'm, I'm sure Jerry was trying to get a medevac, but between that and, and getting it organized, he, he died. He took it right smack in the middle of the chest, so... Yeah, it was, it's interesting. I mean, this is probably not what actually happened, but my recollection is we were here, mortar rounds started to drop, so we moved over here, the other side of the field. Mortar rounds started to drop over there, and we moved back again. And I, I, you know, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if it's just a figment of my imagination, but that's what it seemed like. <laughs> Wherever we moved, they were dropping mortars on now, us. Now, well, Jerry and one of the fire teams is trying to form an LZ and get your wounded man out. Um, were you and the other fire team what, providing security or on the flanks? I remember that we were in a particular area where this all happened, where they, the guy got shot. Jerry had me take my fire team off to the right and set up kind of a blocking position to see what's going on in front of us. What's Flank. interesting about a firefight? You're here. And the only thing you know about this fight is this. You have no idea what's going on over here. You have no idea what's going on over there. 
you watch your area. Each individual man has got his own area to watch, and that's all they know. After we pulled back, I don't recall hearing any shots or getting shot at. I remember somehow I ended up in an area where they were bringing all the wounded. It was like a triage area. There was three, four, maybe five guys there that had been hit. Gene McCrossin was one of them. Jim Hastings was another. They were coming back. They were coming to reinforce us. And what happened and there? And they walked into an ambush. Their point man, or I believe it was Shaw, was hit. He was down out in the open. And they lost a couple more guys trying to get him out of there. And then after that, it, 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 it just stopped. It's, it's crazy the way it, it, it starts. There's a long fight, and then it just stops. So Hastings, McCross, and a couple others, you see them kind of get brought into the triage area, the, the well, perimeter they, that you guys yeah, have Well, set they up? were in the triage area when I, had, when I went by. I don't know why I went by that area. I have no idea. I don't recall. I don't know whether Jerry sent me somewhere or something, but I ended up there. I knew McCross, and at that time I didn't know Jim Hastings, but he was there. They both had got whacked in the hands or in the arm. They ended up uh, they ended up getting medevaced out of country. I don't know who the other people were. I mean, it, it's you know, it was it was people from other squads that I didn't know. Uh, I think Spear at that time, I, Spear, sure, I get those names confused. I think he was the one that was going in, grabbing guys and pulling them out. And the last time he went in, he took a shot. I believe he got hit in the chest, and he eventually died. So Sergeant Wayne Spear was uh, Spear? from 2nd yeah. Platoon. Um, so second platoon also got called into the fight. I, I'm yeah, guessing the, the whole, whole company did. The whole rest of the company came. Yeah. Um, and from what I'm told by Jim Hastings is that uh, Hastings and McCross and tried saving Spe uh, Shaw because he was wounded and kept being shot at by the enemy. They were only feet away from him, but as soon as they jumped jumped up to get him, they were both shot. Yep. So now they're wounded, and that's when Sergeant Spare runs in. Grabs McCross and carries him out, goes back, Gets Hastings. grabs Hastings. Yep. As he's pulling Hastings out, a round goes through Hastings' arm into Shaw's, uh, into Sergeant Spare's back, and out through his chest. Yep. People get yep. the Medal of Honor for less. Nobody got anything. I mean, there were so many guys that did things that should have rated a medal, but because there were so many, nobody got anything. Yeah. That, that wasn't right. Well, that's the thing. You've got to have witnesses. And we had witnesses all over the place for some of these actions, but nobody got a thing. I mean, it, it's not heaven and earth to get a medal. But when somebody does something like that, they're really not thinking. Because if they thought about it, they wouldn't do it. They're going to run up there with 14 people shooting at you, grab this guy and drag him out of there. That's, right. not, that's not normal. But there are character traits, and I think yeah. that's where the you know courage describes that. Yeah. Courage is you know yep. they might not be thinking, they're acting, and they're doing their job, and they might be very yep. good well, at they're, that. They're, 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 they're reacting to their training. Yeah. They're reacting to instinct. Right. And the rational brain isn't usually yep. working in combat, yep. right? You, yeah. You're just using rational brain, brain is gone. You're, you're going on instinct and training. Say, hey, my my job is to go get him. I got to go get him, and out there they go. Yet, at the same time, a huge portion of our society, yours and my generations, would never do those things even. So after that, what, what, what's your company doing after the Tet Offensive? After, after you guys pull out of that Dodge City fight on the 13th, where are you guys sent? Are you guys sent to... I remember when, when, we, when we pulled out of there. We went back to the road. We got in trucks, went back up to Hill 55. I think we stayed there a couple of days. I'm not dead sure. And I think we still wandered around. So sometime late March, we went to Anwa. So between February 
in late March. We must have just gone back to our fireman approach. They just sent us wherever they sent us. So the command chronology say throughout February and March, uh, from February 7th to 10th, you guys were um, put under the operational control of 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. February 16th, you guys were under their operational control in February 20th. So you guys oh. were working for 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. That must be when we went to Hill 10. I think it was Delta 1-7 had that hill, and we went there to relieve them so they could go on an operation. Okay. That's, that's, that's in there somewhere. I'm not exactly yeah. sure when and, it was. Yeah, we have it written down on that map right there. So February 7th to 10th. February 16th and February 25th, you guys were under the operational control yep. of first. So you're up at their base so they can go on an operation. You're yep. covering for them. You're doing patrols in that area, which is about 10 miles north of where you had been um, operating for most of your tour. And then the command chronology said that you guys were assigned to the Anwa area in March. It was in March. Okay. Um, and so uh, the operations for Anwa is what? That puts you in control of Liberty Bridge? No, we didn't. Liberty Bridge had its own unit. It was a, a company from somewhere at Liberty Bridge. My company was at Anwa proper. And when you're assigned to Anwa, you're assigned basically as securing that base. Security was our, was our thing. Uh, I remember going on one patrol when we first got there. It was a company patrol. It went all the way around the base. And then I don't recall going on another patrol after that. So we were three months out in the field. Pull you back to base No duty. hot food, yeah. no shelter to sleep in. We're just laying out there in the cold and the wind and the rain and all the other stuff. So we were pretty worn down, and I think they knew it. We hadn't stopped. Yeah. We, we had hooches. Yeah. We didn't have, the bunkers were out on the line. We were in sheet metal roofed hooches with cots to sleep on. Blankets, so the showers compared to where you were. Mess hall. It's the four seasons. It was home. I mean, it was it was like being in your backyard at home. It was it was phenomenal. I mean, talk about the feeling of just being in a hooch with a cot. What does that do to you mentally for your after morale? sleeping on the ground for all that time? Uh, after having eaten sea rations for all that time. Always being short of something, short of water, short of clothes, short of something. You had never had enough of what you needed. To get back there was, as you said, it was like a five-star hotel. And again, it was, it was nothing. I mean, the average person would look at it and say, oh, what a rat hole. But to us, it was heaven. <laughs> you know? Hooches, a mess hall, hot showers. You could stay in that shower as long as you wanted, and the water stayed hot. <laughs> it was amazing. Okay, well, we really had to do, we had whole watch at night. We had, uh, L they did send out some LPs, and we had base maintenance, trash pickup, that kind of stuff. That was it. Yeah, you have a little working parties were basically trash pickup. I don't recall, I, th I think we had beer given to us every now and then by the platoon sergeant. On Anwa? Yeah, of course it was. Calling Black Label. <laughs> what was it? Calling Black Label. Horrible stuff. It's like drinking dish detergent. And warm? Terrible stuff. Oh, yeah. We had no ice. Everything was warm. <laughs> but as I said, you know, after being in the field for three months, it was, it was heaven. Yeah. And then, uh, so after you guys are done with your rotation at Anwa, is that when you're sent up to Liberty Bridge? Yeah, that's when they moved us to Liberty Bridge. We came, a, uh, I don't know how we came across the river. I don't recall. I think we came across on a ferry. I remember being on Amtrak's heading toward Liberty Bridge. There was myself and another guy. We were going on R&R. &R. So they dropped us off at the road leading up to Hill 55. It may have been by truck, for all I recall. I, I just don't remember. So where'd you go on R&R? &R? Hong Kong. Seven days in Hong Kong. What's that like? Oh, that, it's amazing. Amazing place. 
were you, uh, what's the excitement, the buildup before you go there? Are you like, I'm getting sucked out of this war? Just to get out of country, which is probably a bad thing. Because you get out for the seven days, you're totally relaxed, you're living in the real world, you got nobody shooting at you, you got nothing to worry about. And then you go back. Now you're lazy. From seven days of doing nothing. <laughs> it, Your it, instincts are gone. It interrupts that mindset, right? Yep, that's what it is. Back to but it. you know you you know what it is. You're used to it. You've been doing it for six, seven, eight months. And then you go out and now you come back into it and it's like you first got in country. You gotta start all over again. You gotta get your mindset right. You gotta get your instincts right. Yeah, you really have to wake up to it again. Right. What did you do on R and R? Everything. Yeah. Drink. Eat food. Sleep. <laughs> and just just totally relax. Did your money go pretty far? Oh, over it there? went. Yeah, it went. It went far, but it went quick. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had to call my mother and have her send me some money. Oh, that's great. And they probably had plenty of Western Union set up over there for you. Yeah, they did, but I I never got the money because I had gone back to Vietnam. And so this is June. Uh, Jerry had just left, and Jerry Chong was your squad leader, and they make you squad leader. So you had picked up Corporal. No, yeah, I did because I picked it up at Anwa. So uh, when I had left for R&R, I was an E4. the deal with being a squad leader is you're responsible for all these guys. You give a bad order, you do the wrong thing, and somebody could die. Yep, so I get back to Liberty Bridge. Again, I don't know where it was, the fourth, the fifth, something like that. All right, so I got a squad leader. I got a bunch of guys that I don't even know because it was, it was the third squad, and I had been in the second squad. So I got these guys. They don't know me. I don't know them. <laughs> you know, it, it was kind of an awkward situation to get thrown into that thing. Okay, it wasn't the same squad I was with. So I take over the squad. Uh, we go out on that road sweep. The whole company went on the road sweep. And that was on the 12th. And the big guy decided that that was the end of my time in the big rifle range. Going home. Got hit by a booby trap. And it's, I didn't step on it. My point man stepped on it, and he was probably 20, 30 yards in front of me. It blew his leg off. It knocked down a couple other guys, but they didn't get hurt, and I caught one piece of shrapnel. What do you remember from that? It, that it, uh, I remember saying to him, be careful for booby, and that's as far as I got. I never got the word trap out of my mouth, and he stepped on it. All right, and then I remember coming to when I was on the ground. And I'm looking around and saying, what the hell's going on? And all of a sudden I can't breathe because I got a collapsed lung. (laughs) Corman came over, passed me up, and I had to wait about 20 minutes for a helicopter. Horrible. Your mind's going, you know. I will say, I did not feel any pain. I did not have one second worth of pain. I don't know why. Maybe it was shock. I have no idea. Waiting for the chopper. Finally get on the chopper. Now I'm saying to myself, i got to get from here to the hospital. <laughs> That's a long way to go. Were you having trouble breathing? No, at that point, no. He he patched up. I didn't. He didn't go all the way through, so he just patched up the front. Did you have a sucking chest? And that stopped the sucking on the chest, the, the chest wound. So it, 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 I don't know, it was just like... Another day, except I was in a so panic. How big was the shrapnel that you took in the chest? I don't know. When I went into the operating room, I asked the doctor to tape it to my wrist because I wanted to see it, and he never did that. So I don't know. I mean, it's a good size hole. Even now, heels. It's probably what? It's probably inch, inch and a quarter, and it's probably a quarter of an inch wide. So center chest, you took a quarter yeah. of an inch shrapnel. Yep. Got lucky. Took out one of your lungs? Went in, hit something, a bone, or whatever it hit, it deflected to the right side of my chest, collapsed the lung. And that was it. As I said, so nope. by the grace of God, it yeah. went, le- it went mean, right well, instead well, think of left. Of, think about it. Because if it I went hit, left, it would have I got hit here. What if I had been here? What if I had been a little bit higher? I mean, it, that was the one spot 
in that area that it could hit and not kill me. Yeah. <laughs> Things that are hard to think about, and you almost can't think about it because it just is, right? It's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Could have taken out the esophagus, could have taken out the heart, it could have deflected the other way, taken out the kidneys, the stomach, or whatever. But it just happened. I happened to be in the right spot at the right time. It hit, took off to the right, collapsed the lung, and, and stayed inside. Didn't come out. Did you get any other frag on you? Nope, just that one piece. That okay. was it. One piece. What are the odds of my being in that one spot at that time? <laughs> you know? uh, uh, Crazy. And had somebody else already tripped a booby trap on that patrol too? The, the point man, he stepped on it initially. It uh, and, and this is weird. I don't know if this is just, again, a figure of my imagination or I actually saw it. But I saw him go straight up in the air, do a 180, and come back down again. That's my memory. That's what I remember seeing, or I think that's what I saw. And uh, it blew his leg off. So I caught one piece, he lost his leg, nobody else got hurt. I, I was there and then I was on the ground. Behind him? I was, I was back two or three guys, okay? Well, the first team was in front of me, or a team was in front of me, so that's four guys. So I was either the fifth or the sixth guy back. Got the point, man. Knocked on the people that were between me and him. Hit me, Jeez. and that was it. I, I, I went to the ground. I don't recall falling. Uh, obviously, I was stunned. I came to, didn't know what happened. I mean, why am I on the ground? What's going on? And then I couldn't breathe. So you guys must have been in a staggered column for it to not hit those other guys, right? Well, it was just a, a, it was just a column. It wasn't. It was. It was. We were on a trail. All right, we were heading. The trail came and went this way, to the right. The people we were, the reason we were going that way was another squad had tripped booby traps, and they had two men down. So we were going down there to help them. The trail curved to the right, and we went straight for some reason. Must be because they were off to the left. He went over, there was a log, and he went over the log. And when he stepped over the log, that's where the booby trap was. He stepped right on it. Kind of weird. I have no idea what it was. It it couldn't have been all that powerful, actually, if it just got the first guy and knocked down three or four guys from the, just from the blast. Well, I suppose that could be pretty big. The log could yeah. have also absorbed a lot of it. Yeah, it well, like actually, a two fifty or actually, he was. Well, I'm not sure which side of the log. Round? I don't know which side of the log the booby trap was. I don't know. It was on this side that he stepped on it, or when he stepped over. You know, actually, he probably had to be on this side. Otherwise, the tree would absorb the blast. Yeah. Don't know for sure. Probably never will. So your time in Vietnam ends on June, what was that, 12th? June 12th, 1968, somewhere around noontime. Yeah, seven, seven months, some odd days. They fly you to Da Nang? Yeah, went to the to aid station in Da Nang. That's where they did the operation, yeah. Were you conscious during the operation? Oh yeah, I was. I was. Well, I was alert until they put me under. Cause I remember, I remember telling the doc, "Hey, that piece of shrapnel, tape it. Tape it to my arm so I can have it. I want to see it." But what? I spent a week in Da Nang. We got stabilized. They flew me to Japan, Drake Army Base, Drake Army Hospital. Spent about a month there, and then they flew me from there to Chelsea Naval Hospital. Chelsea Mass, Mass here right in Massachusetts. North of Boston. Yeah, it used to be it. I don't think it's there anymore. It, it's you go over the Mystic River Bridge. Or it used to be the Mystic River Bridge. You hook up right at the bottom, and it takes you to the hospital. Interesting story there. I was in D Ward, which was a recovery ward. They're going to send me over to the rehab ward, which was in a separate building behind the hospital. They give me all my paperwork. I don't exist as far as the Marine Corps is concerned. I got it all. I went home for 30 days. <laughs> what are they going to do? So I'm in Vietnam. They going to do nothing. All right. All right I'm, so I'm, you're going to... I'm wounded. You feel like you've earned some time home, so you went UA from the hospital. I just didn't care. <laughs> you didn't care. Uh, I'm going home. That's it. I went home. So you... I mean, you're only 30 miles away, right? Yeah. Draft into uh, 
Chelsea, about 35 yeah, miles. Roughly so. 35 miles. Uh, you hung out for 30 days, and then hung you, out you for said, 30 I gotta days, go back, get paid. Bought a car, drove back to the base, went around to the rehab board, and said, here I am. They just sent me over. He looks, he looks at me, and he says, okay. <laughs> I stayed there for I don't know how long I stayed there. I don't know how many, how many seven-day leaves I got. I must have had a half a dozen of them. Because you had leave accrued. You had leave that was accrued? Yeah, the, no, yeah, well, I had, no, because this was uh, convalescent leave. Didn't touch my regular leave time. This was above and beyond. Okay. And you never got tagged for your, uh, no. your 30 well, he, days free. He knew. He yeah. saw it. He didn't give a he shit. Didn't, he didn't care, man. It was a, it wasn't. Did you run into any other guys you knew at the hospital or anything like that? Ran into Jim there. Jim Hastings was there. He was still at the hospital. Yeah, he was still at the hospital when I got so there. So he was wounded on February 13th. Yeah, he was in bad shape. So four months later, he's still at the hospital. When he's you still got at the there, hospital. Plus that month. I remember seeing him there. Which he, he didn't remember me, but I remembered him for some reason. Because you guys were in different schools. Probably because from Massachusetts. It was me, Jim, kid from Braintree, Italian kid. Chavone? Chavone. He was there too? He was at the hospital, no. But I'm saying we, we were in the same platoon, the same company. And we're all from Massachusetts, so we knew each other. Yeah. So you and two other guys that you served with lived in the 30-mile radius of each other, roughly? Roughly, yeah. That's pretty cool. So what did you, what did you do? How did you get discharged? How did that work? I went from the rehab ward down to Quantico. Went to the guard company. I was an E-4, but they didn't have any other sergeants. They no, kept they, you in the Marine Corps. I tried. They wouldn't let me out. <laughs> well, I think he can get down there and do this. I said, no, I don't think I can. I didn't have to do anything. They kind of yeah, No prolonged guy. standing, walking, running, talking, jumping, nothing. Yeah, I was, I was sergeant of the guard. Acting sergeant of the guard. One day on, two days off, every third weekend. Okay. And that, again, is just you going around from checkpoint to checkpoint, making sure guys are on guard That's Let's all go around and check, see what's going on. Were you on. a hard I, ass or you kind of didn't give no, a shit? I, why am I going to be a hard ass? <laughs> what do I care? I'm getting out. I've got a short time to go and I'm out of here. Are all these other guys <laughs> just getting off of their Vietnam all those, too? All the guys were Vietnam veterans. They all came back. Most so you guys them, all had... They all had purple hearts. You guys all kind of had that camaraderie a little yeah. bit, right? It was, uh, you know, they, we had two challenging posts, which means they were armed. Their rifles weren't loaded, but they had bullets. They needed them. Every night you would have a, a, a boot lieutenant would be officer of the day. So he'd come around with you and you'd do this, you'd watch, he'd see what's going on. At the gymnasium, they caught another boot lieutenant breaking in. His story was it was a prank, he just wanted to steal a trophy. Well. The officer today, lieutenant, and this lieutenant were buddy buddy. So he tells me, "Don't don't write it in a log. Don't don't make any reports on it." Now, I know it's an unlawful order. I don't have to follow it, but I'm not going to get into a big pissing contest and have this guy on my back all night long. I wait till the next day. I go go see the top sergeant, right? Give him the log. He looks at the log. I said, "It's an entry that should be in there that is not in there." And then I told him what happened. He said, well, I need a written report on that, so I write it up. I don't know what happened to that lieutenant, but I'm pretty sure he didn't stay in the Marine Corps very long. <laughs> I'm sure they, they threw his ass out. Really? Yeah. Something as simple as that? They wouldn't a, want to send a boot. him to He's not a lieutenant. He's a boot. I mean, he's in, in advanced training. It was a joke. I mean, you know, I was, when did I get there? I'm going to guess. Well, I remember being home for Thanksgiving, so sometime in November, late November, early December, I went to Quantico, and I got an early out. I got out April 15th, 1969. So you did two and a half years? Yeah, no, two years, seven months, 19 days, but I didn't count. <laughs> you had a four-year enlistment? Three. Three? Back then they did three-year and two years? Yeah, it was a three-year. Had your choice. Two, three, or four. Or six. I said, I'll take the three. I should have taken a friggin' two. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
And so maybe that's why they sent you on a float before they sent you to Vietnam because you had the three year. I would think so. It, it kind of makes sense, you know. As opposed to guys who do two year, they send them straight to Vietnam. Yeah. The other guys that I went in with, we were all three years. So three of them went right away to Vietnam. I went a year later. Brad went. Uh, he went a year later also. So he went about roughly the same time that I went. He was a cook. So of the five guys you joined with from your hometown, two were wounded in action? Yeah, me and Stan. And, and uh, three made their tours? The other three completed their tours with no incidents. What did you do after the Marine Corps? Nothing. I did it well. I didn't know you could collect unemployment. <laughs> I would have collected unemployment for as long as I could. I jumped around from job to job to job. I couldn't hold a job. Did nothing interest me, you know. Uh, I got married in August, 1969, and then I had to get serious about it. I ended up working at Wyman Garden in North Grafton. Uh, they had a training program. I went in as an inspector, an in-process inspector. That was my job. They had a notice put up that they were looking for people to train as machinists. So I put in for that, and I actually, I didn't think I'd get it, but I actually got it. I'd only been with the company like three weeks. What do they do at Wyman Gordon? They were there. It used to be an Air Force plant. They make parts for planes and helicopters, but it was under the auspices of the Air Force. After Wyman, Wyman Gordon, they, they rotated shifts meaning you would work two weeks on one shift, two weeks on second shift, two weeks on third shift, and I would come back around again. First and second shift, I was fine. That third shift, I just could not do that. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Two o'clock, I'm on, I'm looking for a place to sleep. And I, then I went to a small plastic company. I went to this company because it was small. They had like 200 employees over three shifts, different departments. So I went in as a group leader for quality control, of which I knew nothing. <laughs> but I could use verniers and I could use micrometers and all that kind of stuff. But you've been doing manufacturing type jobs. Yeah, this, this, well this was, it was quite quality, it was inspection. You know, it was again, it was in process inspection. You would inspect the parts as they came out of the machines. You had gauges and different kind of things that you used to determine whether they were in spec or not. So I did that for about a month and then they, they never had anybody officially doing production scheduling. So they were looking for somebody, asked me if I wanted to do it. I said, oh, definitely, without a doubt. <laughs> Knowing nothing about scheduling, not know a thing about scheduling. So they brought in a guy from Kansas City. He was supposed to work with me for six weeks to train me to do this job. Well, that lasted two weeks. And they called him back to Kansas City. Now I'm on my own. I really have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> you don't think any of your fire team leader traits carried over to th these types of jobs? It seems like uh, I, I, leadership, you're scheduling guys to go on patrols, off patrols. I, I like think that. that the military gives you a different frame of mind. Okay? If you gave me the job to do, I would do it to the best of my ability. Okay? I wouldn't dodge it. I wouldn't try to goof off. I would do whatever you gave me to do, and then I'd go on to do something else and I was able to make decisions. So I think that was a big factor because I ended up as the number three man with that company. There was the plant manager, there was the production manager, and then there was the production control manager. I was number three. Okay, I had 150 people working for me over three shifts. How many years did you do that job? I stayed there for 13 years. I did that job for probably 12 of that 13 years. And then they started, I was going into business. Me and another guy, we borrowed $10,000 each, opened up a, a video store. And it was hot at that time. It was big money, and it was big money. Video stores? Video store. It was unbelievable. So you opened up your own video store? Unbelievable. So we opened up one store. It went beyond imagination. It was fantastic. We opened another one in the next town over. We got them both where they were fairly even. 
and then we split it up. He went his way, I went my way. Then the video started to slow down. This was, you know, went into it in 1985, and somewhere in the early 90s it started to die, and you could see it coming. So next to my store, in this little strip mall, was a convenience store. And the guy went out of business. So I managed to buy it for $9,000, lock, stock, and barrel, everything was in there. So I moved my video store into the convenience store. I got two businesses under one roof. And the video lasted for maybe another another couple years, and then it really started to fizzle. So I just kept the adult videos, because you, you could buy an adult movie for $8, and you'd make $50 on it. <laughs> it's crazy. And I did that till what, 2000, 2001, 2000, 2000, no, 2000. I sold it in 2000. And I did nothing. Then I got bored, needed something to do, so I went to Pinkerton, security company. They were still around? They were still around. Are they still around? Yep, Pinkerton. There's a lot of history behind the yep. Pinkertons. There is. It's an amazing history. So I, I went with them. I was uh, just a, a security guy. That was it. That was my job. Here you go. This is your shot. This is your desk. Those are the rules. You're all set. Don't worry about it. So I did that for six months. Then they were looking for a sergeant. I said, yeah, that sounds like a good deal to me because it was next to two bucks an hour. Didn't really do anything, so I got that job. My job was to drive around at night in a company vehicle, checking all the different posts to make sure they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Sergeant of the Guard. You that were was it. That, that was that my job. I was known as the mobile supervisor. <laughs> ah, full circle. I did that till 2008. So you got out of the Marine Corps doing that, and then yep. you kind of retired off of that towards the end of your career. Yep. Wow. Crazy. Now, you told me a story about uh, a funny story when you were working at the video store, and a guy came in, and you totally messed with him. <sighs> tell me that story again. The guy comes walking in. Okay, he wants to sign up. We had memberships. You sign up for the membership. and you For get your up. video store? the video store. So he comes walking in, and I'm looking, and I'm saying, I know this guy. I says, yeah, I need your ID. So he gives me the ID, and I look, and it's Jim Hastings. I look at his hand. His hand is crippled up. I says, I'll be damned. So I start playing with him. He says, you look like you were a Marine. He says, yeah, I was. I says, matter of fact, I think you were in Vietnam. 67, 68, something in that area. And now he's got this puzzled look on his face. I think I was in a hospital with you for a while. And he still didn't know who I was. <laughs> so I told him who I was. He later told me he went home that night and he was just totally confused, totally baffled. <laughs> Not only were you in a hospital with him, but you guys served in the same company. Yep, same company. Fought on the same uh, hill. What are, what are the odds? Same you know, battles. What are the odds of three guys from Massachusetts live within three mile, 30 miles of each other, ending up in Vietnam, on the same company, on the same hill. What are the odds of that happening? <laughs> That's great. And then, uh, so then for a while, what was that, the early 80, mid-80s? Did you end up connecting with those guys? And Yeah, we, we, we got together a few times. Uh, Siobhan, he had a partnership with somebody for a pub-type restaurant down in, in uh, Braintree. It was called Caps. So it was kind of an odd name, but they had these baseball caps all over the place. Just, uh, all military stuff. What was unique, what was a tremendous idea, was that each booth, he had pictures of high schoolers, different sports, different this, different that, and every booth had these pictures. He told us that people would come in and I want booth number six. Yeah, my son's picture is up there. And that's what they were doing. It was like that all over the restaurant. I mean, it was a genius idea when you think about it. People had something they could reference. Yeah, my son's right there on that wall. They feel a connection to it. Yep. A long story, but I gave my son some choices. And one of them was to go into the military. 
So he didn't know what to do, so he asked me. I says, well, to be perfectly honest, you go into the Marine Corps, you're going to come out with a useless trade. You'll have some sense of responsibility and things of that nature, but it ain't going to help you make a buck. Army, pretty much the same way. So that leaves you the Navy and the Air Force. I says, if I had my druthers, I'd go into the Air Force. So he went into the Air Force. Absolutely loved it. He did eight years. Uh, he fell off a ladder, hurt his back. So they mustered him out. They wouldn't let him stay. So he would, I think he would have done 20 years if they had let him. He loved it. He was a civil engineer, I believe is what they called it. But he can do welding, plumbing, electrical work, carpentry work. He can do a little bit of everything. In fifth grade, I decided I was going to join the military. I knew I was. Uh, I just always liked the books and histories. But a, a big influence was when we would come here, you always had a Memorial Day cookout and a Christmas Eve party. And you had a pool table in your basement. And I would go down there and I would play pool with the other younger cousins. But then you had a picture down there. And it was just you. And it was in a shadow box and it had your medals. And I thought it was the coolest thing. And I mean, I always looked at history as like, especially the Vietnam vets, because they were all the dads growing up, right? So there's that influence. But there's also like this mystery behind the Vietnam veteran. And no one ever talked about Vietnam. And my mother knew how much I was interested in, in, in military stuff. She got me all the books and all the movies and stuff. But whenever we would come here, she'd be like, you may be interested, but there's something called respect. Some veterans don't want to bring that stuff up so do not bother your uncle with that okay <laughs> but I think she told you one time I was interested and you brought me down there and you gave me this thick book it was like a time life book it said Nam on it and I brought that home and I put it in my bedroom and it was in my bedroom until I graduated high school and I still have it in my library but I would just read through that book over and over and <laughs> over again and then I, I was like you know what I'm going to join the Marine Corps similar to you there was five kids from my graduating class we all joined uh, not on the buddy program, but we all joined together. We oh, went to the recruiter together. Time. And it was, uh, but I think my senior year of high school, I came here for the Memorial Day party. I was going to boot camp in a month or less than a month, a couple of weeks. And I remember you like walked up to me and I was by the pool and I think you gave me like a, a mock punch in the cheek and it was like, you're an idiot. And then you shook my hand. You're like, congratulations. And uh, you said, I'm proud of you, and I thought that was great. I think I, I probably told you something like, when you get there, you keep your mouth shut, do whatever they tell you to do, and fade into the background. That is what you told me. <laughs> and uh, you don't want them to know your name. Yeah. The big problem with Vietnam, they underestimated the enemy. They thought they were just a bunch of ragtag farmers, and they were going to go over there, and in six months, kick their ass, and that would be the end of it. That's what they thought going in, and that's why they lost. Hubris was one of the worst things from our commanders, you know, leading this war. And you read the books by, uh, like, McMaster's book, uh, Dereliction of Duty, about LBJ and, um, yep. and uh, what's his name, McNamara. It was hubris. The it was... The wrong people at the wrong time. It was fighting what they called a limited war analytically. Like, they were trying to do it That's the all, most efficient way. All by the numbers. Everything was by the numbers. We were fighting a limited war. They were fighting total war. Yes. They were fighting on all fronts. Political, actual, propaganda, all that kind of stuff. And we didn't do that. We followed what the French did. Of course, the French lost, okay? It's not their troops that lost, it's their commanders that lost. And we were in the same situation. It wasn't our troops that lost Vietnam. It was the commanders all the way up to the president. Johnson's big concern was about not being the president that lost Asia. Right. I mean, the only benefit that I give them is that hindsight all historians will say hindsight is something that you can't use to judge people historically. And the concern they had was 
They called it a limited war because they didn't want to get the Reds involved. They didn't want Russia and what? China, China to get involved. Right yep. They thought that if we crossed the 17th parallel going into North Vietnam, that uh, we would get a Korean War. Exactly. And and I can sympathize with that alone. But the biggest problem was creating a structure that only allowed yes men generals to be heard yep. and shut out the contrarians. Did you have you read the Pentagon Papers? Yeah. Yeah. They knew in 1965 that they weren't going to win this war the way they were fighting it. They knew it, and they did it anyway. You know? Well, we got to escalate. Well, if we escalate, won't they escalate? Yeah, but we'll escalate more. But well, won't they escalate more? You, Th that's where they never asked, now what? Never. Well, it's all right in there, plain as day. What they were doing in the background, what they were talking about amongst themselves, why they were doing certain things, it was foolish. I look at it that you got the Vietnamese civilians, you got the North Vietnamese on one side, you have us on the other side, and we're all pulling on it. You know, they're stuck in the middle. When the Viet Cong and Vietnam and Viet are there, well, they have to side with us. They don't have a choice. When we're there, they have to side with us. They don't have a choice. It's, uh, they're, in a, they're, in a, they're in a tough spot. What are they going to do? You know, you, you hear stories that they go into villages and they just wipe the village out because somebody collaborated with the Americans, which is most likely true. I know that one night at Anwa, the village got hit and got hit bad. They should have been blaming the leaders, from the president all the way down, all the way through Congress. What bothers me the most, we go into Vietnam, we drag the South Vietnamese more into it than they were. We supply them with all the arms they need. We train them. We do all these things. And we tell them, we'll be here. We're going to back you up no matter what happens. And what happens? We pull out. We cut off all the financing to them to, to be able to fight the war. They were to the point where they could fire like 10 rounds of uh, artillery a day, and that was it, and then they were out. But thank you so much for sitting down and talking, talking with me and, and doing this. I appreciate it. Well, better days are coming. Here we are, 76 years old. Never thought I'd make it to 50. Still going strong. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Seth.